The second year of the master program, I had the chance to go abroad and I went to UC Berkeley in California um, in, the, in a Robert Knight's cognitive neuroscience lab and then I had the chance to put into practice what I had learned and that's when I started to work on a speech decoding project. So what I had to do is analyze electrocorticographic data or ECOG which is basically we implant electrodes in people's brain um, and then we record the brain activity with those electrodes on the brain and then we do some experiment with the, the patients. They, they stay at the hospital for about one week or two weeks and that's when we get the chance to collect data. Uh, those are epileptic patients, so they need the electrodes implanted to monitor the brain activity and to localize the seizure onset, the part of the brain that doesn't function well. So that was a one-year master project that I got familiar with the physiological data, how to analyze them. And then I really liked the project and I thought I wasn't done with it. There was still more to do. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to explore also another lab um, to see new horizons. And that's why I decided to join a brain computer interface lab uh, here at TPFL, but still collaborating with Bob Knight at Berkeley and still working on this project. But I thought that way I get both more like the cognitive side uh, and the neuro, neurological aspect from Bob and then also um, the more like engineering skills from Jose Mian, which was my professor here at TPFL. And then I thought it's good to have both because then I can really try to work towards a speech BCI or speech assistive technology. And that was the idea. So during my PhD, I continued to work uh, on this speech decoding uh, project. And so I had to basically come up with new task designs to do with the, to do with the patients, uh, record more data. And really the goal was to decode inner speech. So when people cannot talk or communicate, uh, we wanted to provide them uh, an assistive technology and we were wondering if it was possible to directly decode the neural activity associated with inner speech as compared to other BCI technologies that already exist but maybe uses a little bit less natural um, or less intuition to control, for instance a spelling device or, or moving a cursor on the screen to pick one letter. So we really wanted to provide an alternative way of communication. And for this, it's a pretty difficult project, like any project, but with inner speech, it's difficult because we cannot monitor precisely what they're thinking when. Like if now I'm thinking, I am hungry. When did I start? When did I finish? What word was, it's difficult to label the data. So that's one first challenge that I had to face or we had to face during the PhD. How can we design experiments that allows us to label the data or to know what people are, are thinking when? And then the other aspect is more like the analyzing the data, which is to come up with the best algorithm to extract the information where we could find it and then eventually coming to, with a BCI application. Yeah, so there's several different aspects I tried to investigate during my PhD. It's because it's still unknown when you think. It can be abstract representation or you can rather hear your voice in your head. So I tried to analyze if there are uh, different speech representation that are encoded also when you 
you, when you have your inner speech uh, active. For instance, when you speak out loud, you can hear the sound, or you have phonetic uh, uh, decompositions, or you have words, you have semantic, and it's those aspects that we know how they are encoded when we speak out loud or when we hear speech that I try to investigate if they, are, if they were also encoded during inner speech. So I had several different tasks, and then the last one I investigated during the PhD is can we identify if a person is thinking one word or another. If we think in terms of BCI, it would be very relevant if we can decode naturally if a person is thinking yes or no, or hungry, pain, a few clinically relevant words that would be already a good step uh, to move forward. And that's what I could show, that's what we showed in the, in the study that we submitted to the, to the BCI award. Currently, all the results we showed were, at, in, were analyzed offline. So this means we recorded the patients at the hospital, then we got the data, we analyzed the data and we showed results. But the next step is to go online. Can we replicate those results really in real time and having maybe um, like decoding the brain activity of a person, decoding the word she was or he was thinking and then speak out loud that word just as a proof of concept. And then I think we're still a little bit far or this is a realistic but then for instance the results we showed it was only classifying one word versus another so it could be a yes versus a no but then there are still many steps to to improve the accuracy and having really a BCI that works and so the next steps are how to improve the for instance the classification accuracy Uh, yeah, I think in general you have many of those moments, ups and downs, during the PhD and probably afterwards also research in general. It's like a roller coaster. Um, I think it's really challenging to work with the inner speech in general because compared to when you speak out loud or when you hear speech, you can really know exactly at what moment uh, the, the, you can know the brain response and mark the data and and then in addition the signal the brain activity is much stronger so you have really beautiful plots you have beautiful activity with the inner speech everything becomes a little bit more blurred and difficult because the signal to noise is more difficult and then your trials for instance if I if I say ten times the word hungry then you have speech irregularities, like I'm not a robot, so it's never gonna be 10 times exactly the same word. So in addition, you don't know when the person thinks, starts, the onset, the offset. So it becomes really difficult to extract the information. Like you know more or less it happens at this time, but you don't know exactly when the different phonemes happen. So that's a little bit the frustrating part. How do you come up with algorithm that deals with those specific issues? How do you design tasks that, that can exploit uh, the maximum capacity of this problem? I think that's the PhD life, like finding solutions, right? And that's how I try to adapt to maybe classical algorithms to, to adapt them to the specific problem. So at the end, when we have the, those results, it's really a euphoric moment, it's, it's exciting and that's the good uh, aspect. So. Originally, I was not thinking that my research was a good candidate for this BCI award because it's supposed to be a BCI award, a brain computer interface. You're supposed to have, I thought at least at the beginning, that you're supposed to have a closed loop interface, something that works, something that really shows uh, uh, 
yeah, an interface. Or, and then after discussing with my uh, supervisor, Jose and Bob, they actually suggested that the work we did on the speech decoding project was still a good candidate because although there is not the BCI per se, it's still a work that that is re relevant for the field. Maybe because it's a little bit different, because it opens the door to new BCI applications. Uh, and then that was, I think, the interesting part of the project rather than an application per se. I think the BCI award is great and gave the chance to to projects that are not necessarily BCI per se, but still uh, important and relevant for the field. And we had the chance to submit an application and we won the second prize. So that was really encouraging. And, and then in the future, probably we will uh, move towards a closed loop BCI and increase our chances uh, and maybe win the first place.